Okay, welcome back to our um, to today's event on thinking and um, and discussing about a stronger global Europe. Uh, we have uh, now an excellent panel um, that will be covering and discussing about the challenges, security challenges the EU uh, is facing. And for this um, panel, we have an excellent chair. Uh, Judy Dempsey from Carnegie Europe. She's a non-resident senior fellow. Many of you will probably know her from uh, her uh, blog or the blog she edits, edits uh, Strategic Europe, which covers many of the topics we're going to be talking, talking about today. And she has previously had a very long and successful journalism career in the International Herald, Herald Tribune and the Financial Times. Uh, she will be introducing our great panel, Thank you very much, um, Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angel, and uh, everybody can hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Oh, we have, um, Rosa, Rosa has certainly, Rosa Balfour has certainly um, put a cat among the pigeons in terms of high standards. So we have to be on our toes and I'm sure we will be. Um, I'm very honored to be chairing this really interesting and complex panel. Um, one of our um, panelists has had to drop out for an illness, Professor Dr. Tobias um, um, Schumacher. Uh, he's from the European Neighbour Policy um, Programme, but, um, a chair at the College of Europe, so unfortunately we won't have him. However, we have four other excellent panelists, Professor Dr. Esther Barbe, Senior Research Associate Institute in Barcelona. It's very nice having this spread across Europe. We have Professor Dr. Chad Damro, Senior Lecturer, University of Edinburgh. That's, that's very interesting, uh, up in Scotland. Professor Dr. Melton mutfuller Batch from uh, the Dean of Arts and Social Sciences, Sabachini, uh, Sabachini, sorry, um, Sabanchi University. Uh, Good morning, or maybe it's good afternoon, nearly there now. And uh, an old colleague and friend, Dr. Martin Zaborowski, Policy Director, Future of Security Programme at LOBSEC. So, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to have you. Um, I don't know whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage, but we have uh, one and a half hours. It, start, it starts now and it ends at uh, 10 past one. So, it means we have an awful lot to to cover, but um, also we try to engage um, the audience as much as possible. So I think the idea is um, we have this very, uh, um, oh, it depends how you define it, it's, it's a very challenging title, the EU's key security challenges in a global context. Well, um, certainly uh, Rosa Balfour set, up, set out the scene and all the pros and cons vis-a-vis -vis authoritarianism, democracy, but we now have to put, look at the nitty gritty and look at these security challenges, uh, not, just, not just in terms of countries, but in terms of issues, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of ideas. So I think I, I am going to be very um, conventional and start off uh, on the alphabetical list, uh, Esther, um, I think I should kick off with you immediately and as succinctly as possible. You don't have to name all of them because there's an awful lot of challenges. But in, in, your, in your lexicon, what are, what are the one or two main challenges? Okay, uh, well, first of all, I would like to start thanking Sade colleagues for inviting me to participate in this kickoff meeting of the Engage project. And I also want to thank you, Judy, for sending us some questions yesterday to answer during our session today and to organize a little bit the, I mean, the talk and the debate. Well, um, since then, the first one, I thought that for me, the best, best thing would be, you know, asking what are the challenges. Um, but and, and since I'm the first one, um, I'm going to do a very big picture. I'm, going, I'm not going to go to concrete, very concrete, uh, you know, aspects, but I will try to try, try to, to, let's say, to, to enter this big picture. And I think that the main challenge the EU is confronting, I mean, in security terms or in international terms, anything you want to mention is the fact that the European Union is confronting the crisis of the international liberal order. And we are in front of, or of a real crisis. You can very say that we are the, at the end of the international liberal order. And, and I even can recall um, Catherine Ashton, then when she joined the High Representative Court, <clears throat> she said immediately, 
uh, something like this is not longer our wall. So the thing is that um, historians of international relations would say that right now we are living a moment of transition of power. So in other words, this is a moment of changes in terms of shift, uh, shift of power. And uh, even a few days, a few years ago, Graham Allison published an article and then a book on the this transition of power. And he was uh, um, defining the transition of power as uh, to feel the strap. I mean, describing uh, the existence of a tendency towards potential war between the US and China. Uh, well, this was kind of very, let's say, um, academic thing and quite provocative. So what I would like to do is um, approaching the transition of power uh, from the lenses of the current uh, COVID crisis. So I'm going to take the, this corona crisis or COVID crisis um, to ask more or less what, have, what we have learned from this crisis. And I think that I would like to mention two things. The first one is that the crisis make us make absolutely clear, made very clear that we have this um, uh, shift of material power and how this uh, shift of material power affects the union was quite obvious because the union has started to talk a lot about the vulnerability uh, of the European Union in front of, mm -hmm. for instance, a technological uh, dimension, the mass diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, what was the reaction of the union in front of this feeling of this perception of vulnerability? I mean, um, putting together a new narrative. And this is more, more or less what Rosa Balfour was saying. I mean, how important is narrative? And in this case, the response of the union was very much the narrative on a strategic autonomy, strategic autonomy, strategic sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other, uh, the other lesson I wanted to mention is um, we, we have taken from, the, we have learned from the, the, this crisis is how important is the role played by multilateral institutions. And now I come to your first question, uh, do they again multilateral institutions and how, you know, they do um, think that how important they are. Well, during this crisis, we, I can take the, the example of the World Health Organization, WHO, and we, we know, all of us, that the institutions mean that they, they legitimize norms, they legitimize rules, et cetera, et cetera. But what we had in front of us was an arena for political rivalry. I mean, how much the World Health Organization became a bit something like a place where the rivalry between the declining uh, power, the US and the emerging power, China, use the, the occasion, you know, to, to the place, you know, to, to fight there, to, to become uh, rivals in this place. So how was the reaction of the EU in front of this situation? The reaction of the EU in front of this situation was the World Health Organization is a necessity, is necessary, is the way appropriate to fight, you know, global problems such as uh, a pandemia, is the appropriate way to do things. I think that in this case, the EU was really responding in the way the multilateralism is the European way of life. A little bit, uh, multilateralism has been internalized by the European Union as a constitutive norm, not just regulation. It's not just regulating, it's more than that. I mean, it's, it's a constitutive part of the European Union. So that means that if the crisis of the international liberal order is, um, is not always a question of shift of power, but it's also a question of uh, contesting multilateral institutions, using multilateral institutions as a political rivalry space, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this crisis um, helped me to, to introduce also the, the point about how multilateral institutions are being contested at present. I mean, the golden age of the 90s is, is you know, it was is behind there. Now we are in a very different world, as Catherine Ashton say. And now we in a world where we are in a world where um, multilateral institutions are contested by the states, by non-state actors, mm -hmm. and multilateral constitutions are contested at global levels, are contested by Global South, for instance, but they are also contested within the European Union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is a point about how internal and external, you know, dimensions can be connected, can be linked. Um, just a note to illustrate a little bit this, um, what I mean when I talk about contestation. 
If we talk, for example, at the global level, contestation of um, multilateral institutions is very much linked to the idea of that they are not representative enough. They don't include all the um, states or the representatives that they should be included. So they are not in representative enough. IMF is one of those cases, UN Security Council is another mm -hmm. case, etc. Another contestation at the global level, and this contestation can be found also mm -hmm. within the EU, is that maybe the multilateral institutions, they are going beyond their mandate. And in the security field, this can take us, for instance, to responsibility to protect issue, well, I just leave the question there, but that, this is one idea. And then going, going to the EU, uh, within the EU, I mean, at the EU level, um, contestation of multilateral in institutions means contesting either global institutions, we notice that uh, regarding the World Trade Organization, WTO, demonstrations on the European states uh, against World Trade, World Trade Union, but also um, I mean, um, contestation of the integration process, because the main argument would be um, we have been uh, transferring too much authority to multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. We are in front of a denationalization process. And we all know, of course, that the migration crisis in 2015 was one of the, the main points uh, where we found these things. I could finish there, uh, Judy, maybe we were going to tell me something. So I just want to finish with the idea that contestation is very linked to problems of legitimacy of the multilateral institutions in terms of effectiveness. It was a normal thing. And also in terms of representativity and in terms of acceptability of the role played by the European, uh, yeah. European institutions, European Union or other institutions. Well, thank you very much for your attention. You are muted, Judy. First time I've used Zoom, I'm only joking. <laughs> Esther, I, I take you up on the security challenge or challenges in a few minutes. I forgot to mention that uh, Martin Zaborowski has to leave at 12.30. And this is the curse of, of, of Corona. Everybody thinks we can run around from Zoom, 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 and webinar, webinar. We've got 24 hours every single day. So, but Martin, we completely understand. And because he's Zed and he should be at the end, uh, he can't be at the end because he has to leave. And I'd like to involve him in the discussion later on. Martin, I forgot to tell everybody, you've got between five and seven minutes. So you can choose one of the issues I brought up, whether it's the multilateral run or the, 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 the key challenge, facing the EU or what does this global governance mean, you're on. Okay, thank you, Judy. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, great. I, 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 and apologies for jumping the queue. Uh, you know, I'm, you know in, in Poland, we get told off a great deal for jumping the queue in with the vaccine and various things, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, but uh, so thank you for facilitating it. Uh, I think that I will just make three very brief points about like, you know, what are the key security challenges for the EU in the uh, global context, you know, these days. Uh, and I don't have great news here. I mean, I don't really see it very, you know, um, I'm not very optimistic about it. You know, the three points are related to the EU environment. Number two, the weak, weakening of transatlantic relations, despite, you know, the uh, very positive summit we had yesterday. And thirdly, I think most importantly, the value crisis in the European Union. So on each of these points, you know, the environment is just very unstable. Like uh, I remember when I was joining the EU Institute for Security Studies about like 10 years ago. I'm not there since then, of course, yeah. But at the time when we were thinking about EU security challenges, it was all thinking in terms of uh, that the EU can choose conflicts it wants to be involved in. Uh, so whether it's helping, you know, Africa, helping, you know, North Africa, you know, uh, promoting, uh, you know, democracy in Eastern Europe, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. These days, you know, the EU does not choose conflicts. The conflicts, you know, come to the EU, yeah. Uh, and the EU is increasingly in a defensive kind of posture and at the same time, 
you know, the EU own security and defense mechanism are not set up for the defense of the EU itself. Uh, uh, the common security and defense policy, it's all about like, you know, providing help and support to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, failed nations in some other parts of the world. Uh, it's not really for defending the EU core area itself. So that's a bit of a problem here. And in terms of environment, Russia is run by a very angry president who thinks that he's been tricked uh, and he is looking for an opportunity to revenge. Uh, and uh, Russia is increasingly like meddling in EU internal affairs. Its money is, pres is you know, uh, uh, financing far-right parties across the entire Europe. Uh, uh, we have disinformation campaign, you know, run by Russia today, but also by you know, some regional outlets. So um, we've, we are obviously all aware of, you know, what Russia is doing in, in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, good news from the summit yesterday were that, uh, um, you know, that the, there is a cohesion of the West in facing up to this challenge. Uh, I mean, good words, you know, in practice, it doesn't work out that way. No? So that's Russia factor, then we have the sovereign neighborhood factor. Uh, you know, I mean, it just remains a source of instability. In terms of like a threat of terrorism, that one perhaps a little bit is not as much as it was 10 years ago. Uh, but because, you know, Al-Qaeda was you know, broken down, ISIS is, you know, uh, not as strong as it used to be, but still the southern neighborhood remains the source of instability. And there is also the China factor. China factor, which is, you know, coming up as a, you know, the pole of world power and is very present in Central and Eastern Europe, is very present in the Balkans. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the factor which uh, is challenging the U.S. global position, yeah? and the Europeans are not uh, are only waking up to you know to facing up to this challenge. So that's number one. The environment is just not great. Yeah? Number two, transatlantic relations. Um, you know, we obviously now have a president in the U.S. who is an Atlanticist who wants to uh, work closer with the EU. Uh, uh, we are just only recovering from the from the Trump. Uh, you know, four years, which were very bad for transatlantic relations. Uh, but things are not back to normal. And I don't think that things are likely to be back to normal for a very long time. Uh, why so? Uh, because, you know, while Trump is in the Atlantis, he does have expectations about Europe. Uh, he wants, he wants European, you know, helping hand, at least in looking after ourselves in terms of the, you know, defense investment. Uh, and we are just not there, you know, the EU and Europeans are not in a position to actually provide the United States with the helping hand that it expects. Um, and at the same time, the mood in the United States, despite the fact that Biden was elected, despite a very Atlanticist team that he has, uh, you know, it's around 50% of Americans now that support the US uh, continuation of U.S. presence in NATO. I see that. Yes, I see that. So, uh, so the uh, the Americans are just you know increasingly lo uh, losing their uh, interest in the EU. Yeah? Uh, obvious things. And number three, uh, and I'm getting getting here to the end. Judy, thank you. Uh, we have a weakening of democracy and the growth of populist parties all across Europe. Um, and interestingly, that factor links to the first one because these parties are sometimes financed by, by Russia. They are all pro-Russian, with some exception of the Polish law and justice, which is not pro-Russian, but law and justice doesn't care about foreign policy anyway. So, uh, so it's it's just not very important here. And uh, um, uh, and so we have that issue. But since we uh, Global economic crisis 2008, then migration crisis 2015, 
you know, populist parties have been, you know, on, on, on rise, yeah. We have had the expansion of illiberalism across Central and Eastern Europe, uh, you know, uh, after the EU membership of countries in Central Eastern Europe was um, materialized, uh, the uh, incentive to continue democratizing themselves have somehow increased, decreased, has decreased, and at the same time, the EU has lost the the instrument of of actual influencing, you know, the the, the poorer and poorer democratic standards across Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and the crisis of the rule of law. So uh, I think the challenges are huge, and the biggest one of them is the EU own value crisis. If we get this one right, then the other things will be easier to handle. Thank you, Martin. Well, um, your point about um, we can't choose our crisis. I mean, the crisis comes to us and sometimes the EU is not ready. A lot of the time it's not. And uh, we can go on to this later. Uh, thanks for sticking to the time. Um, I just wonder, for the for reasons of discussion what is normal in the transatlantic relationship nowadays i mean it's been changing in any case since coalitions of the willing, willing under bush too so we have to be very careful you know what does normal mean and um, i i don't know is the eu losing interest in the e is the us losing interest in the eu well the boeing the boeing airbus thing is mega i mean trade trade carries enormous interest and this has values as well but we can go into this and as for Poland I think it's it's a terrible shame that the big country in the EU called Poland doesn't have a foreign policy we can go into these issues later but thank you for raising them I want to go now up to Edinburgh uh, across to Edinburgh rather to uh, to Chad Damro. Chad are you there Yes, I am, Judy. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we'll have to spin down to, to Turkey. Um, between five and seven minutes, uh, Chad, you can pick any topic you like, but we have to, we have to home in, keep, keep, keep in mind the, the key security challenge in the global context, if the EU really does matter in the global context. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to stick to that time limit. Please feel free uh, yeah. to jump in. I, I'd appreciate it if, if I start getting close sure. to the end of the seven. Uh, but gr greetings to everyone uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland. It's a, a pleasure to be here today. And so my initial response to this topic for the panel uh, is that there are, and I think this has been echoed in the previous comments, is that there are external uh, and internal challenges facing the EU. And so in many ways, it's difficult to disentangle uh, the internal and the external challenges. And this is especially the case when we appreciate that, you know, challenges don't always respect borders uh, or, or any internal external uh, distinction. And so to prepare for and to address these, these numerous challenges from various sources, the EU is often seen as working toward achieving the, let's say, ideal of a, a truly joint European security and defense. Uh, but then how do we do this, right? And the short answer may be that the EU can do this by joining up the numerous EU policies that comprise or can comprise its foreign policy. I'm speaking here of more than CFSP and CSDP, broadly conceived, you know, it's the external relations. And that reveals my intention for, for these prepared comments today is that I want to draw our attention to uh, and open up the conversation uh, on the role of what we might call external action and external action plus. Because I think it's here where we can begin to see some of the EU's opportunities uh, and its limitations for dealing with the vast array of challenges that it faces in the global, global context. And when I say external action, we can include some of the well-known policy areas, for example, uh, like the common commercial policy, trade, uh, development policy, humanitarian assistance, neighborhood policy, etc. And external action plus maybe gets a, a bit less attention, right? But we can think of this as the, the traditionally internal policy areas that are increasingly developing external dimensions. Um, there's a huge population of these policies, right? Examples including competition policy, environmental policy, uh, health policy, uh, energy, human rights and gender, migration, etc. There's the whole host of single market issues relating to regulation. 
But note that all of these other policy areas, right, both external action and external action plus, they include variation in the types of legal competence uh, as we've had them enumerated in the Lisbon Treaty. So immediately this tells us that different EU institutions and actors uh, can be expected to be more or less involved in EU policy making uh, across these diverse policies. And so to put it mildly, that creates a, a rather complicated picture. All right. Uh, these concerns, of course, uh, inform questions then about the extent to which this complicated picture, right, with different EU institutions, uh, actors, capabilities, instruments across all these different policy areas, does that reduce the EU's coherence? And ultimately, does that undermine its effectiveness in the uh, global context? Uh, that is to say, it, uh, does it undermine its ability to attain uh, objectives in external relations? Perhaps during the discussion, we can we can revisit this issue of coherence, uh, including across all the different policy areas. Just as an aside, luckily, uh, there's been great work done on this concept by people attending this event, uh, including Cole Yarab, who we'll hear from on a panel later today, and my own colleague, Carmen Gebhardt at Edinburgh. There's probably more people in the audience, too. Apologies, I just haven't seen all of the names for the over 400 attendees. Uh, but now back to the, the main uh, issues at hand. I think we, we can think of CFSP and CSDP right, as a bit of a hub for EU external relations uh, to help address these key security challenges in the global context. And we've known for a long time that the other non-CFSP policy areas that I'm highlighting can feed into and complement the CFSP and CSDP. We don't have to look any further than, of course, the, the famous EU global strategy of 2016. You'll recall that the strategic review process that led to that strategy made the case for a more joined up EU external action, right? Noting that, um, and allow me just to quote directly here, noting that the CSDP pioneered the comprehensive approach, more relevant today than a decade ago. Uh, a joined up approach is now needed, not only in external conflicts and crises, but in all aspects of the EU's role in the world. And so this puts a premium on various actors and instruments of EU external action coming together to work in synergy uh, and they conclude by saying vertical and horizontal silos hamper the EU's potential global role. Um, agreed, right? Um, I agree entirely with, with, with that statement. You know, the global strategy, it outlines an ambitious agenda, right? A set of objectives for future external action. Um, and specifically in, in reference to this notion of becoming a more joined up union, um, they say that this has to happen across uh, all of the EU's external policies, right? And between member states and EU institutions, but also between the internal and external dimensions of all the policies. So again, agreed, right? But the big question remains, right? How best can the EU then become a more joined up actor to deal with all of these global challenges? And this in many ways really is the heart of the matter, right? The EU needs to solve this puzzle in order to respond to the key security challenges in the global context. And it's an issue, of course, that the EU has long grappled with. We can go back to the 1974 communique of the Paris Summit and the origins of EPC, European Political Cooperation. It's no easier to deal with this question today um, because now the challenges are multiple, right? As we've heard from our uh, august speakers this morning, and we're hearing more from the excellent colleagues on this panel, right? And add to this whole mix, right, that the EU uh, um, external action and external action plus policies have developed their external dimensions, right, at different rates, right, um, over different historical periods. Um, and it gets more difficult both in theory and in practice than to solve this puzzle. Uh, and you might wonder uh, how these traditionally internal policy areas have developed, right, uh, and are developing increasingly important external dimensions. And, and, and we can uh, turn to the work of a lot of academics who have looked at this, um, notably, I'll, I'll, I'll single out Simon Schunz um, and his most recent work with Carmen, or, sorry, with Karsten uh, Gerards and um, another academic uh, named Chad Domro. <laughs> Apologies uh, for, for my own personal plug. Uh, you're running out of time. Very good. All right. Um, they point to a number, three, three really important different factors, right? Um, that is to say, and they're internal and external factors. Um, I can elaborate on these, these more in the discussion if anyone's interested, right? But we have to look at the global structure, right? The factors there that the EU is dealing with, as well as the EU structure, and in many ways, most importantly, the EU agency, right? That is the, the actual practitioners who are involved in this, who, who can drive forward the process and respond to these crises. So as my time is running out, uh, please just allow me to conclude, right? So 
we see uh, an array of internal and external factors. I think it's fair to say that have helped uh, encourage external dimensions in EU external action and external action plus policy areas. And I think by looking at these factors, that, that'll help us understand how the different policy areas interact with one another over time. And also perhaps it can help us build an explanation of how external action and external action plus policies can then be woven more seamlessly into CFSP and CSDP. And so uh, in short, as I noted at the outset of my comments, the challenges facing the EU are both internal and external. And so I think, I think it makes sense that the solutions must also reflect this, this internal and external. Um, yes. This will help us see across policy areas and the silos and perhaps hopefully take us closer to achieving uh, a truly joint and might I add effective uh, European security and defense. Yes. Thank you, Judy. No, thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, you know, I, I'm torn. I wonder are silos a good thing because what you have now is huge institutional competition, actually. Um, you know, if, if it's not the EES, it's the council, it's the commission, it's the various DGs. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole um, beehive of competition uh, among the institutions, which actually, um, which actually um, inhibits effectiveness in, in many ways. And if you want an external action plus, um, I mean, that means it's got to be very hard hitting and you need really coherent, tight leadership at the top and a consensus that you don't go around backstabbing each other and competing for the, for the photo ops and, and, and other things. It, it distorts, it, um, it, it takes the eye off the ball when it comes to crisis management. Um, speaking of crisis management, we're going to go down now to Turkey and it's a great pleasure to have Meltem Mufluffer Badge. Do I is it badge? How do you how does the C cedilla? Um, is it is it is it badge or badge? It's badge. You pronounce it perfectly fine. Thank you, thank you. And it was very very nice to have you. Um, uh, I was going to say on the program, on the on the on the on the on the virtual uh, show, whatever. But um, I, as you have a very special perspective, clearly, um, for inside and outside. So. It, you can pick which, whichever theme you like, but clearly the main one is the security challenge mm -hmm. facing all of us. Please, you've got between five and seven minutes. Okay, thank you, Judy. Uh, well, when I was thinking about what points that I would like to stress the most based on also the email you've sent yesterday and some of the discussions we've already had uh, this morning, uh, you know, we are all aware of the multiple challenges that the European Union faces. And we worked on it, you know, under previous projects together with Chad, when we did the transatlantic relations and the trans world, EU list for European foreign policy, you were a part of that, Judy, too. And a lot of things that we've been discussing since, you know, 2010, 2011, we're still discussing more or less the same challenges. But at the same time, I think the tools with which we can actually answer it or you know, find various policy options or some kind of a theoretical understanding or an explanation of these challenges have, I think, worsened over time. And uh, before I go further into the security aspect of it, I still want to say a few words on the way that the world has come to a full stop last year and the impact of the pandemic, I think, on the way that the European Union is perceived from outside and internally, both inside and outside, in and of itself is a security challenge. And that, that's actually an additional complication that adds on to the traditional security challenges, traditional security risks that we you know, focus on, such as nuclear non-proliferation, terrorism, organized crime, um, systemic instability, failed states as uh, Martin was, you know, alluding to in his uh, talk, and I think now we are probably looking into something that maybe we didn't conceptualize in our project, and uh, we might need to think about it, is the very existential threat to our survival as a human species. Uh, that, I think, is a new take on the whole security framework that we are trying to assess. And uh, so just to make something very clear here, I think what the pandemic has done and what is now presenting itself to a significant challenge to the international institutions and to the European Union as an you know, 
is an epitome of a multilateral cooperation project is how when survival, you know, the very basic survival of human beings are at stake, most of these institutions have failed to uh, deliver. So that's, a, you know, based on some of the points that Judy and Chad have already uh, you know, looked at. You know, it goes beyond the question, is the European Union effective? So, you know, what is the European Union expect to be effective on? And what are the key threats that now are, you know, posed for not only, you know, the European security, but also for yeah. all the countries in the European neighborhood? Now, if the pandemic is an indication mm. of the actual threats that are now changing, yeah. I would definitely bring on climate change, something that we are not tuned to think about for the future. I mean, I'm now sitting in Istanbul. There is a gigantic uh, rain storm. You know, summer has not arrived. It's probably not an indication of climate change. June is never very hot, but there is a significant, you know, transformation underway that we might not yet have the tools to deal with. So something that I would like to stress in this, you know, in this opening, let's say, uh, panel is probably we need to rethink what we define as a security challenge. So the traditional security challenges on which the European Union is tuned and created to respond to might not be that relevant in the next couple of years. And on top of the uh, climate change, I would bring so health issues, you know, everything that relates to uh, human health, the climate change, and I think what the European Union is also encountering uh, for the future is a very significant demographic crisis. Now, that in itself is also a security challenge. And uh, now I was just reading the other day uh, about certain predictions for the future of Italy, for that matter, and how in certain parts of Italy now there are, you know, all the maternity wards are closing down, schools have closed down, they combined, you know, uh, 10 and 15 year olds together in one class in order to you know, at least have more than one kid in one class. Uh, the pandemic, the first factor and the demographic crisis, I think is combined together in the sense that the pandemic has probably made that worse and people are now changing their plans for the future, uh, you know, creating or leading to much smaller families. So if Europe, and this is something Rosa have, you know, uh, mentioned in her speech, the demographic balances in the world, if they are changing in a way that our initial predictions have not given us sufficient uh, information as to what might happen, that brings the fourth, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up, that brings us into the fourth security challenge, and that's migration. And as Europe is getting smaller in numbers, then, uh, and, you know, in other parts of the world, that's not necessarily taking place in the same speed. It's also taking place, but not in the same speed. So there will be more migratory uh, pressures coming on um, the European uh, Union as well. So four challenges, health, climate change, demographic balances, and migration. And these are, you know, these combine, these, you know, change the very way that we conceptualize non-proliferation, organized crime, everything that fits more into the traditional uh, framework. So what is the answer or what could be the possible ways that we can actually uh, pick certain instruments to deal with these challenges? More multilateral cooperation has been generally the, you know, the point where the arrow, uh, you know, looks toward. But I think we also seen that multilateral cooperation has significant problems in and of itself. So uh, more targeted multilateral cooperation, which is something that we are planning to do in the project, um, you know, planning for the future, dealing with these risks and trying to map a more uh, cooperative format with strategic partners. Who are the strategic partners? You know, we talk a lot about the US and the EU. Uh, we bring in EU and China, but, you know, so is Iran, is, you know, it's in the picture. Turkey is now becoming, as we've discussed this in other platforms, you know, its accession to the European Union is no longer feasible or possible in the near future, but it's definitely a major strategic partner uh, who is engaged in the accession process, at least on 
paper, but all these, you know, four main challenges requires an engagement with strategic partners in ways that we didn't think before. So those are my initial comments. Thank you. Oh, Malcolm, that, that was super. Thank you very, very much. I mean, everything you've raised, um, climate, pandemic, demography, migration, they're all about human, they're all about humans. They're not about weapons, except they can be weaponized. These are enormous human, in some ways, human-made security challenges. And um, when you mention, I, I, I will have to touch on this later, uh, this um, still maybe more targeted multilateralism, but at the end of the day, maybe this is controversial, but engagement means not isolating other players. And we have to talk to each other and find the tools for dialogue and listening. Everybody scores to settle and winners and losers, but there's going to be no lose. There's not going to, there's not going to be any winners with this, with this, um, with these four issues you raised. Um, thank you. It was very, very, very interesting. All of you, you, you gave a lot of meat for thought. Um, Martin has to go off at 12.30. Martin, do you want to jump in quickly before I go on to the questions? Because um, I don't want to, to we, have, we have two questions waiting, but, but in the meantime, Martin, before I deal with the questions, is there anything you'd like to jump in and you feel passionate about, or if you've left out something or you want to pick up something that, that was mentioned by Esther or Chad or Milton? Um, no, no, not really. I mean, perhaps, I mean, I would just like to say that, um, you know, there were some points about CSDP. I think we, we all know that, yeah. I, let me ask you something. Yes. If I may. Um, Poland is a big country mm -hmm. and you're now having a spat with the Czech Republic over energy. Mm -hmm. Tell me, since Melton brought this up so eloquently, but the whole climate issue, leaving aside the pandemic, I mean, what if, what's the perception in Poland of the Green Deal, or, or the, is is climate is climate a big political and social economic issue in Poland? It is becoming. It is becoming. Yes, I mean, it is also becoming a, a point of um, on, on on which you, you you have to have a platform, whether you are a conservative or a you know or, or a progressive. If you live in a big city like you know Warsaw or Krakow and you deal with smog, so it doesn't matter whether you are you know pro-government conservative. I mean, it affects you. So uh, so yes, you know it is it is becoming an, an, an and with the time it will become you know even 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 more of an issue than now. Uh, Poland is now considering the uh, well, it's not considering. I mean, it, ha it has to put up a, a nuclear plant at some point in time. You know? Very soon, uh, uh, well, very soon, uh, very soon it has to start to decide whether it's going to be with the Americans or with the French. Yeah? Uh, definitely not with the Russians. We just, that's one of the things that we don't do in Poland. Yeah? Um, so uh, so the, it will have very profound security implications for sure. Uh, okay. And actually there's a very strong preference in Poland to go with the Americans, but the Americans are not that interested in fact. Okay. So, <laughs> Thank, thanks for this, Martin. And it's an issue I really want to home in on uh, later in this discussion, because um, if we, if if the Europeans say and believe that they want to lead on climate, they have to communicate this, and they yeah. have to explain why the price of diesel is going to go up, or why there's going to be autobahn speed limits, or why people will have to pay for more. And um, thank you, Martin. I'm going to up the. If it's, it, does any any of the panel want to chip in here, or can I open up the floor to? The question, the questions and the questions which are coming in. But nice to open up the floor, unless uh, Esther or Melton or Chad have some little intervention. Okay, so I, I'm going to be uh, quite systematic on this. We have a, a question from Juan Pablo Soriano. Um, Juan, I'm only giving you one question for the moment. For the panel on EU key security challenges, from your perspective, what is the level of threat posed by non-state actors specifically transnational organized crime networks. Ah, so that's very interesting, especially given what's happening in Turkey. <laughs> this um, former mafia person, Meltem, was going. And it, now, trans, this is important, this transnational networks. Anybody like to chip in here? I mean, 
this is one of the big um, issues that's always out there and it's very difficult intelligence agencies and other law enforcement agencies to crack down on. I mean, is this a big challenge for us? Can I jump in very quickly? Please, just, please. I haven't watched any of the videos, but I'm hearing it from here and there. But a, the answer to that question, I think, is tied to the fact that what we see, you know, as interested observers or scholars is generally, probably, apparently, at least in countries like Turkey and Italy, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, is the tip of the iceberg. And the actual negotiations, political and economic sharing, all this rent seeking behavior is taking place at a completely different level, which is, you know, beyond uh, societal scrutiny. And there is, you know, very low accountability and that in return decreases the overall political legitimacy of these uh, actors. So that's a very good question, but it's a very hard question to answer because it's very hard to have the empirical data on it. I mean, there are certain things we can actually deduce from the things that, you know, are heard or, you know, contracts signed, but unless there is a whistleblower, you know, that's you know, ready and willing to talk about it, empirical data is missing on this. Great, thanks for that. And um, those out there, if you want to ask a question, I think it's best to keep the, the question very, very short, very targeted, and who, who you want to answer, because I have paragraphs here of questions, and I'm not going to read them out, because it, there, 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 there are lots of ideas, and just one targeted question. Okay, I'm going down to... Um, uh, Felix Dogan, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Damro uh, about France and Germany as the leading countries of the EU. Uh, can they converge in terms of creating more efficient CSDP? Uh, and Chad, without getting too technical about it, this is actually quite an important question, the role of France and Germany, if you could be brief about it. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Felix, I think the name was, All right, um, for that question. And so, um, yeah, okay. Uh, the role of France and Germany, I think, probably will be essential. Um, but, but I'm also minded that, um, you know, when, when you take a broader look at the workings of the EU's institutions, without trying to get too technical here, Judy, of course, um, that it has to go beyond France and Germany as well. And especially if we come back to um, the notion that I tried to articulate in my comments, that a lot of these security challenges don't really respect the internal external distinction. And, and we just saw an, uh, um, an example of that in the previous question from, from Juan Pablo, I think it was. Um, uh, um, but I, I think what you have to have is you have to have really, you have to have um, not necessarily unified, but you have to have um, a coalition that meets the certain thresholds for decision making. Right. And so France and Germany, for technical reasons, are very important. Right. And for legal reasons. Right. Um, uh, in the decision making process, but also for political reasons, right? For political momentum, they are important. So th th there's no denying that. We can't deny that, right? Um, but but I do think that, that, that it's important to bear in mind um, that that because of the decision making procedures, right? And because of the, the sort of the, the internal external uh, dimensions of, of a lot of these, these security challenges, um, you really do have to have uh, some type of a coalition going forward, right? Hopefully that, that that's that's a helpful response to that fine question. The issue of how one country sees soft power and the other country sees hard power in terms of France and Germany. Um, Martin, are you still there? I think Martin has left. Pitting I'm, I'm still here. Uh, uh, Martin, I have a question from Ian Bond. I'd like to ask Martin if he has time to answer. Why populists are so are popular in so many EU states, Russia backing is real and may help the populace, but they don't create them. Is it economic inequality, social change going too fast for some people, or what is it? Well, I, I do think it's the whole variety of factors. I mean, the immediate factors it were the crisis of 2008 and 2015. Uh, to which the, the mainstream you know, political parties were unable to respond in a satisfactory manner. I actually think it's pretty amazing that the, in a negative way, it's pretty amazing that the, uh, the left-wing socialist parties were not, did not capitalize on 2008 uh, economic crisis. This is, so they left a void and far-right you know, filled this void. 
uh, actually, you know, with the with the what what was initially the criticism of capitalism as a as a political system, really. Yeah. So the left wing missed this chance. You know, the far right, you know, filled it in because there is no such a thing as void in politics. And then, on the top of that, in Europe, we had the migration crisis in 2015. And migration crisis, whatever we whatever we think about. Uh, you know, how the Europeans should be responding to that. The truth is that the Europeans were scared uh, by the wave of migration coming to Europe in 2015. And the governments were very often not in sync with that. The governments were kind of, you know, telling the Europeans, you shouldn't be scared, you know, you, you should be welcoming. Uh, and, 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 and then, you know, you have the far right saying, you actually should be scared. And many people were. So, but so, but the the, uh, the the void was being filled in there. Uh, also, that's a more like a you know political science kind of the argument here. But you know, over the last 20, 30 years, the mainstream parties have all shifted to the center. So the the you know the Christian Democrats became indistinguishable from social democrats, really. When we look into the German politics, what what the SPD is arguing is really not that different from the, what CDU is arguing. And as everybody is moving to the center, there is more void emerging on the fringes, both left and and, and right. Um, and so, and the final argument, which maybe I want to bring up here, is that you know the the level of. Uh, you know, the mainstream politics, the, the thing between mainstream politics and political correctness kind of missed the, uh, the social mood. Uh, the, the people were, were, were a, the quite considerable proportion of electorates were not in sync with the mainstream parties with, with regards to how they should respond to globalization, how they should respond to migration, how should they respond to the you know cultural challenges of the you know more liberal expectations, and you know the far right just very skillfully utilized these uh, the sentiments. Well, I suppose there's another argument as well. I mean, there are glaring inequalities and yeah. uh, elements of huge democratic illegitimacy with the European Union institutions. And so demonizing, uh, demonizing the far right really, really negates the whole idea of engagement. I mean, it depends on how, how far you want to take this. And um, I've got, a, I've got an, a question here um, from Dr. Mo Subal, Assistant Professor, Tam Kang University in Taiwan. Welcome, or good evening, or good night. Um, to Esther, many thanks for a brilliant talk. E EU MENA relations. Um, do you see any attempts to influence its southern neighborhood through the ENP, through the European Neighborhood Policy or the UFM? Um, oh, uh, oh, by the way, Chad, you were once his PhD supervisor in Edinburgh. Any case, um, hi. Ed, um, um, Meltham, no, Esther, could you keep it very brief because we've got so many questions, so many, so many questions out there. Can we really influence the, the EU, the, the southern neighborhood? You heard Dr. Solana speaking about that. Okay, well, really, really influence. Um, I think it has been influencing until now. I mean, the, the policies for the southern neighborhood were quite obvious since the beginning that one of the things that the union was looking uh, since the very beginning was kind of exporting norms trying to transform, I mean, that was the, 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 first, uh, the first objective. If we look at the European neighborhood policy when it started, no, at the beginning of the, of the 21st century. But since then, the thing is that it has become more and more obvious that it's more and more difficult that the union can get exactly what, what the union wants. I mean, we want to explore our norms. Want, we want them to rule in the same way that we do, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that bilateralism has become a new way to do things with Southern neighbors, mostly. And I think that that uh, is an expression or a fact that it's becoming more difficult for the union. I mean, when the union changed from the group to group idea to the idea of bilateral relations, that was already the point, you know, that um, influencing the Southern neighbors was going to be more, more difficult. And we have, for instance, now a recent case, that's the case, you know, of the crisis with people 
uh, jumping from Morocco to Ceuta in Spain, you know, swimming, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, I mean, the international context was so very obvious there that it was very important. I mean, everyone was thinking, what are the United States going to say? So I think in this case, it depends on how Washington reacts, the role of the union is going to be more or less influenced. So I would say that uh, uh, is less influenced than the union thought at the beginning of the 21st century that it was going to be in interrelations with Southern neighborhood. Of course it yes. is, it has yeah. instruments, but I think the, the influence is, is less than the union thought that it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly um, now there's sort of, th thank you for, for that um, answer, Esther, and the whole role of the EU in the neighborhood. I mean, do we want stability or do we want democracy? And democracy is messy, and but it's necessary and young people want it and they want participation. Um, I just want to, to say yes. one thing. I mean, you can read all over the places that the big mistake, I mean, France and UK did with Libya in 2011. So I think it was a mistake. So like, it's a general idea now, Yes, you know, so well, we go to your point. In this well, case. Esther, you're going to get, you're getting into the whole idea of NATO changing its mandate when it, got, when, when it comes to Libya, frankly, and not preparing for the day after. Uh, we have a question from Pierre Mirel. Thanks for the great panel. Don't you think that the four challenges just listed, uh, climate, demography, um, um, the pandemic, um, innovation, um, Who's, how is this going to be financed? How are we going to keep public expenses under control in aging societies? I mean, this is, this is the big balancing act, is it? Anybody out there want to take on this issue of these things, these things need money and financing and needs economic growth at the same time. And it needs communication. It's, it's an important question. Is it more, more lending, more bonds? Um, anybody has, if, if we, if we, if we believe in these things, then we have to finance them. They won't come free. You can chew on this if you want to. Okay. Uh, you, don't worry. I, I was answering some of the questions on the chat. This, this question came from Pierre, so nice yeah. to hear from you, Pierre. Uh, I, I, I think there is a significant trade-off. And that in return requires, I mean, this is also a very good question. And the aging part is directly related to the demographic change that Europe is going under. Mm -hmm. So it will require, I think, first and foremost, a new type of an, you know, consensus inside the EU to deal with these common challenges. Uh, so the budgets will have to change definitely or the way that budgets are you know, distributed between different items will have to change. But I think it will also require you know, further cooperation with the neighboring countries where, you know, aging societies need mostly, again, the, you know, human contribution to take care of the elderly. Well, Japan now has robots, but, you know, we don't know how effective they will be. That still requires money. So the human component could actually be, at least for the time being, be met with the cooperation with the uh, neighboring countries. Mm. I'm writing answers on the chat, Judith. So there are a number of questions I already answered. I find this one very interesting. It's something we didn't touch on because, because this is a huge security challenge, actually. A question from Rui Marquez. How can the EU trade policy, uh, how, can, how can the trade, trade, EU trade policy be more effective in, in, for instance, democratic, transparent, sustainable, and geopolitical? Uh, this is very interesting. What do you do with trade accords? Do you write in these elements or you just keep them sort of um, very, very... Um, trade orientated or is this a chance to bring in transparency accountability ngos civil society um is this a challenge for the eu i mean is this is this a, a great challenge for the eu uh, using trade trade accords for influence and for actually strengthening um the the, the kind of liberal democratic environment chad do you want to jump in here yes sure um uh, I guess my, my, my initial response is, I think it probably depends a little bit on who you ask. Um, and you can even, you know, um, uh, that, that goes for, uh, you know, across member states. Member states have different views on this, uh, on exactly what these trade agreements should include. Um, but also even uh, within the EU institutions, right? You look at the European Parliament, um, they have a view <laughs> that, that, that a, lot of, uh, a lot of these other, let's say, non-trade provisions uh, should be included. 
in, in trade agreements. Um, but then maybe if you ask uh, negotiators in DG Trade, um, maybe they have a slightly different perspective on that as well. Um, and so, uh, as with many things within this this, this multi-level and, and complicated e European Union, th there really is no simple simple answer uh, to a question like that. Um, and it really does come back, I think, to to this this idea that that it depends on who you ask. Um, and, and so, what what it goes, it, you know. Uh, um, what you have to look at it is you have to look at, at, at what is the final policy output, right? And, and, and at this stage, what we see is we see agreements that, that have a, a number of different articles on them covering a lot of what, again, maybe we can call non-trade provisions included in them. And so if that does go forward, if that continues to be the way the EU is gonna approach this in the future, um, then that opens up an opportunity for us to see ways in which um, a, an external action policy like trade can be used in the future to address a, a, a lot of different challenges uh, that that are out there. Thanks, Chad, for this. We have a question from Tariq Mahmoud. Um, it, he, it, it, to cut a very long story short, the EU needs to reorganize itself, resolving its internal problems with Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Malta, and others. Seems like the whole lot, frankly. Uh, it needs to tackle especially the rights of the far right everywhere inside its borders. Um, reorganize, what, um, does the EU have to reorganize itself or should it just actually use what it has properly, more effectively? Are you asking me, uh, Judy? You, you, you are muted now. Yes, certainly. Sure. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, well, um, but by saying reorganize, I mean, the thing is that the EU until recently didn't have actually a very strong value factor in terms of its policies. You know, I mean, with the value factor in the EU is, is, is a kind of a, uh, um, uh, is the um, uh, is related to the Council of Europe. So, uh, and uh, some, you know, Council of Europe, um, you know, uh, treaties and policies such as the, for example, the Istanbul Convention are not adopted by the EU as the EU, uh, Istanbul Convention on the Prevention of Violence Against Women and uh, Children. So that's the Council of Europe, that's not the EU. And the EU does not have it as its policy at this point in time. So uh, the, 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 the recent crisis with, you know, with, with Poland and Hungary with regard to the rule of law, uh, and then the, uh, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, that the EU actually attempted to sanction these countries, and then that it tied the, uh, in the recent budget negotiations, that there was a connection made between the, you know, the funds and the um, assessment of the rule of law. This is a very new thing. The EU never done these kind of things before. So in, in some respects, one might say that things, you know, this kind of a value related policies that should have been thought about, uh, you know, before the enlargement took place, uh, not after. Uh, it is a little bit late now. Uh, and we certainly need to deepen that kind of a, uh, you know, value related, uh, you know, aspects of the EU over time. And I really think that, for example, Istanbul Convention should become a, you know, EU policy, not, not, not just a, a recommendation there. Well, the EU, uh, the human rights element has been a long time inside the EU's uh, DNA in some ways. And, and the Article 1 and 2 of the treaty, it's there. And we're members of, of other uh, of the Council of Europe and, and others. But don't forget what the EU did with Austria when it imposed sanctions and heavens did it get its fingers burned when the FPO uh, joined the coalition uh, yeah. in Austria several years ago. Um, I have a, thanks for that, uh, Martin. I have a question. Oh, I liked it. This is a very interesting question, which I, I've often thought about. It's from Carlos Campos. Pilios. I have a question about whether groupings of like-minded countries would play a greater role in the future of international relations. Huh. So this is, this is an important question, um, given how multilateral organizations have become more unable to act due to fundamental differences between members. Yeah. So I, I think this is a very interesting uh, question, coalitions of the willing. We, we saw this in, 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 the, in the Iraq war. We see 
We see it actually with France operating the Sahel. It's a kind of coalitions of the willing. We've got coalitions of the willing sort of uh, developing up in the Arctic Circle. Um, would coalitions, not formal coalitions, but would informal coalitions uh, of the willing actually weaken EU so-called solidarity? Can come in? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Please, okay. Sector. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, um, the person who was asking was using the term coalitions of the willing that I link this term very much, you know, to the Iraq uh, attack, you know, at that time. So um, I would say that maybe this idea of uh, groups, no, uh, some kind like of mind, coalition, like-minded, like-minded groups, no? I mean, like-minded groups. I think we have a, and um, a good example of this situation, for instance, from the Iran non-proliferation, I mean, policy when uh, UK, France, and Germany got together and put together, you know, a policy at that moment, negotiations, etc. Until the the, um, the states joined with them, you know, and then uh, they were like a front group. I mean, it was a like-minded group, and then the others, you know, joined. So at that time was already this discussion about, is this good for the union? Is not good because of course not everyone is since the beginning, you know, joining the, the process, et cetera. At the end, I mean, it was accepted as a, I mean, as a good, uh, as a good point, no? And uh, I would say that for instance, I mean, just a moment ago, we were talking about, you know, uh, values, mostly values policies like the Istanbul, uh, convention and gender equality, for example, norms at the international level. Now we have other examples, you know, like for instance, in the norms related with sexual and reproductive health uh, rights. Uh, and in this case, for instance, some countries really are trying to put together some like-minded groups uh, because they feel that like Hungary, for instance, is, is blocking, you know, decisions in the multilateral institutions. So like, I can imagine that more and more we're going to see this kind of, you know, like like-minded groups or advanced groups in these areas where human rights are involved on issues such as gender equality, that it's really a very divisive thing right now in, in the union. So I would say that we have past experiences the thing worked, for instance, in security uh, issues. And I'm quite sure that at present and in the near future, this idea of like-minded groups or, you know, small groups that they take advantage, et cetera, is going to be very much present in the foreign policy issues related with like, human rights or mm -hmm. other values policies. Esther, does the like, um, the like-minded, interests in like-minded countries, um, it, it, it's a security, um, I suppose implications, are, let, let me rephrase this another way. I suppose one of the weaknesses of NATO, even NATO, one of the weaknesses of the EU is that there isn't a common threat perception. Mm. And uh, the regions have different threats. The Northern countries of Europe, Poland, Baltic states see Russia as a threat. The Southerners see migration and, and the Middle East as a threat. France sees the Sahel and terrorism as a threat. Um, Germany is Germany. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a plethora of different interests. Um, but I, I want to go back to this idea. Since we have the Lisbon Treaty and we actually can do these enhanced um, cooperation, I was wondering, would the EU become more effective if we actually implemented the treaties? Yeah, well, that's a good idea, of course. I mean, you, the, the institutions, the instruments are there. The point is, why are they not used? Of course, there is always the political will. I mean, we've been talking all the time about capabilities, instruments, institutions, etc. But, you know, if there is no political will, um, we are saying right now that maybe in, in the past, the, there were diverging interests. I mean, differences were always based on material interests, on history. We are in the North, you are in the South, East, West. You know, for us, Morocco is very close, for you, Russia is very close, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, we're all, all, always talking about what we used to call, you know, European values. So now it's, it's a, even different, you know, it's the, there is like a normative controversy. So for me, it's getting another step more. So this is why I think in some areas like we're talking about human rights now, gender equality, uh, rights of children, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe uh, my, my opinion, at least my perception is that we're going to see more and more this 
union divided in multilateral fora when we deal with this kind of, of you know, um, value principles, etc., policies. For the area of military security, we are talking about hard security. I would say that we have the instruments, but they are not used up to now. So, um, well, maybe the point is about political will there. I mean, we need real leaders in, the, in those cases. We have a, a France really wanted to lead. Uh, we can imagine that we're not going to see Germany leading this kind of situation. So I can imagine right now France leading maybe these this, this situations, but we don't have many other leaders. You know, if we move to this, uh, uh, maybe Poland, now our friend, Polish colleague left, but maybe Poland would be ready to do it. I don't know, you know. Thank you, Esther, for this. Um, I, I'd like to read out this question because uh, it, we don't have a German uh, panelist, but let's see what happens. This is a question from Stefan Auer. Does the EU, in fact, weaken Europe's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Not only is the United Europe not standing up against Russia, but individual member states that could and should have a stronger foreign policy are able to hide behind the EU's weakness and disunity. Germany is the paradigmatic but paradigmatic example of such a member state. Hmm. Well, I don't know if anybody wants to take on Germany on this, but um, um, we have seen Germany with, with uh, Nord Stream. We have seen um, the parts of the Social Democrats very much um, has a much softer Russia stance. The Greens, if they did get into government, would take on a much tougher stance towards Russia. Um, in, in short, if Germany played a much more assertive and active foreign policy, uh, would Europe become stronger? Anybody want to take on this little, little potato? Malcolm, you're sitting in Turkey and, and Turkey's had a very special relationship with Germany over the migration crisis, yeah. especially between President Erdogan and, and Chancellor Merkel. And, um, you know, Merkel has been very careful on, on, on not, she, she's been very, just very careful with this relationship because it's actually, it feeds into the stability or, or the instability of, 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 the EU, of, of the European member states. Well, it, it doesn't have to be specific to Turkey. I think mm. when we think about Germany, it still, you know, plays the main leadership role in the European Union compared to the other players. And I don't think we can think about Germany's role without also bringing into the, you know, in, into the way that France also plays a role. Uh, France and the French foreign policy in general in the European neighborhood, in EU's internal politics, uh, has not been very positive, in, especially in the last couple of years. So, uh, and this Franco-German leadership that more or less worked together, uh, for so many critical European, I think, security issues no longer uh, does. And it leaves Germany as the sole player who's, you know, who's still trying to push a more multilateral position. So that question, I think, is very valid in the sense that if Germany becomes even more visible, then it might have a, um, a greater impact on the European Union's um, security visibility at large as well. But this is not an issue, and I have, you know, my colleagues here know this better than I do, I am sure. Uh, what Germany is able to do externally, it cannot be uh, conceptualized independent of the internal European Union dynamics. So a very visible leadership role, aspiring, hegemonic looking Germany is not going to go very well in European Union's internal dynamics. So even if Germany is you know, ready to play such a role, which I doubt it, it cannot. So there are all these you know, constraints on what Germany can actually do externally and internally because of that. That's just my take on that question. Thank you, Esther, for this. But this feeds very nicely into a question by Aurélie Gautier. Uh, it's, a, it's a question for Chad, um, but please chip in all of you. Bes uh, and this is, I'm not so sure for even, anyway, besides France and Germany, do the other 25 really want the EU to have a united foreign policy? Well, does Germany want a united foreign policy? I mean, does France? So um, Chad, this is for you. Um, 
uh, you can keep it brief and I'd like to hear the others on this. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Judy and Aurelie. Um, my answer is brief. And, 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 and I think again, you know, it matters uh, which member states you're talking about, right? Uh, some of them want, w w are interested in a more unified foreign policy uh, than others. And even, you know, um, um, you know, some of those countries' positions are determined by things like resources, capabilities, geography, right? Who their big neighbors are, right? There, there are a lot of different factors that play into these individual countries' positions when it comes to their preference uh, for or against a unified foreign policy. But then even in those countries, remember, I, I think it's always important for us to sort of um, take take longer uh, um, yeah, longer yeah. longer time horizons to really think about these countries, right? And so uh, different parties come into power in those countries. You see um, uh, uh, preferences amongst citizens changing a lot of different yeah. countries. And yeah. so um, any answer I could give right now at this time, saying this group of countries supports it and this group of country opposes it, um, could be could, could could there could be a different looking picture in another two to three years from now, uh, given the challenges that the EU is facing and the likely changes to some of those governments that we're going to be seeing in the near mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. Great question. Hard to answer, though. Uh, okay, I'll take the question also. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Um, just uh, thinking also the question, I mean, uh, are, are the, other, the other members of the union, you know, already or um, in favor of a unified foreign policy. I think that this question is a traditional one, no? since European political cooperation. You know, there was always like cleavages that helped to explain, you know, who was more or less in favor of unified foreign policy. And it was always very much the same cleavages at the time. It depends on how Atlanticist you are. I mean, if you are more Atlanticist, that means less unified foreign policy. If you are big or you are small, normally the small used to be more wanted more a unified. Germany was an extraordinary case, let's say, because it was a big one, but normally very much in favor of a unified foreign policy. And then there was, there was, of course, geography, if you were next to, like in the case of Poland, but in those cases, Atlanticism was also very important there. And then there is a thing, I mean, a, a variable that has, um, has not really worked, for instance, uh, those countries that were coming from a dictatorship or from an authoritarian regime, that was the case of Spain, the case of Portugal, the case of Greece in the 80s, and then uh, Eastern and Central European countries, you know, already in 2004, etc. In the case of Spain and Portugal, for instance, Greece was a little different at the beginning, but then it changed also. I mean, joining the union was really, I mean, uh, getting to this point that we are really now European and democratic. So the two things went together. So there was a good disposition, you know, to share, if you want to say, not sovereignty, because you are not sharing sovereignty, but I mean, trying to establish, a, I mean, a strong cooperation, I mean, in, in terms of foreign policy and creating, you know, European political cooperation, European foreign policy, etc. So I would say in the case of Greece, Spain, and Portugal, I mean, the past was very relevant in terms of how to be in favor of unified foreign policy. So one could imagine that this situation was going to be the same in the case of Central and Eastern European countries, but it was right the opposite, you know, because it was very much, we just recuperate our sovereignty, now we are not going to share it. So okay. you know, this, this variable, I thought it was interesting how different it was in all the reaction. Of course, the moment was also different, I mean, the, the Mediterranean ones, it was at the end of the Cold War. For the other ones, it was already, you know, in the 21st century. But I think that this variable, you know, I just wanted to mention it because, I mean, how to these two different reactions, I, th I think they are quite interesting. I, I want to come in here on a question, then I want to go on to one about legitimacy. Um, I don't know if Martin is still here. Uh, this is from Maria Isabel Nieto Fernandez, and it's, it, 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 it does tie in with, with this, your answer, Esther. I'd like to ask Martine or Miss Barbe, and uh, please, um, Chad and Melton, come in here because it's relevant to you too. Uh, what degree of strategic autonomy for what objectives and which related military capabilities are needed? 
And the strategic autonomy brings in Atlanticism, brings in those who want a different kind of Europe, those maybe who want a different kind of transatlantic relationship. I mean, essentially, this is the this is the the, the, the big issue, the big buzzword: strategic autonomy. And has it anything to do with foreign a Europe foreign policy or Europe security challenges? You, you can all you can all um, think about this uh, if you would like, because um, I'd like to hear what you well, have. I, I mean, Judy. I mean, uh, the question is if it's related to you know, strategic autonomy with European foreign policy, European security policy. That's the question. Mute. I suppose the question really is um, how, when you depend Portugal and Spain and uh, Greece joined, and then followed by the Central Europeans. It was always a, a Euro Atlantic nexus. It was always joining NATO and joining the EU. Somehow the two went hand in hand. Well, um, yeah, well, the, the situations were different because uh, Portugal yes. was a member of NATO since the beginning. So, I mean, yes. in the case of Portugal, I That's mean, it was, it, was, it was, and it was a pro Atlanticist uh, country, I mean, uh, in terms of security. Uh, in the case of Spain, I mean, the situation was quite different because it was joining uh, the European Union after joining NATO. And NATO was a big, big, uh, I mean, there was a big confrontation in the country regarding, you know, the, the fact that the country joined NATO. So then, uh, for, I think for the Social Democrats in Spain, you know, being member of NATO was like a necessity, but it was something uh, not very appropriate. So this is why at the same time that you want a unified foreign policy, at the same time, you work very strongly in favor of uh, security and defense policy in Europe. This is, I would say, you know, a, a, specific, a specific case that uh, and in regard with the Central and Eastern European countries, I would say that uh, Poland maybe is the most obvious case. I mean, when it comes to security, Poland is thinking on NATO and the United States. So it's right, the, absolutely the opposite, uh, you know, position than Spain. And of course, history is different and geography is different, you know. And I would say in this case, this, this traditional factors in international relations, you know, history and geography become, you know, um, I mean, the, the most uh, relevant variables to understand this, the differences. Yeah, <clears throat> indeed. And, and don't forget the Baltic states. I mean, they're so Atlanticist. We're coming up, we're coming towards the end. I'm reluctant. Sorry, Chad. Yes. Briefly, I've got a great question, Chad. Just briefly, um, in the question from Maria Isabel, um, uh, this idea of strategic autonomy, I guess I've always been a, you know, kind of enamored with it. Maybe it's because I'm a, a recovering American and, and I kind of see it as, as a bit of a reaction to, to the America um, that we had until quite recently. Um, but, but I think, you know, I think that Maria Isabel has pointed out one of the really important um, aspects of this whole idea of a strategic autonomy and that has to do with her point about military capabilities okay. um, and so i'm not an expert in the area i, I i've read about it because i find it fascinating and i think a lot of the answers kind of rely in uh the the, the defense industry right um uh, the, the european defense agency but, but also all of the different uh, um, companies that are involved and the extent to which we actually can have any type of european uh, uh defense agency that really that, that really does um make European military capabilities perhaps um, more than they are reducing duplication, et cetera. Um, and, and so I think that that's oftentimes a, a part of the unstudied story, right? Yeah. The European defense industry um, that really, in my mind, is, is crucially important to discussions of strategic autonomy. Yeah, and, and it's crucially important to, to know if the EU does actually act and think strategically. This is our last question. It's a, it's a pity it's, it's from an anonymous attendee. I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to, to read out anonymous um, questions, but I think this is worth it. So if you want to give your name afterwards, please do or now. Um, the most, here, here, here is this person's question. The most important security challenge is the lack of people participation in public governance. This brings instability, people disaffection, sometimes civil unrest, vulnerability of the state, risk of raising the national flag to divert public attention. I'd like the panelists' reaction, the panelists' reaction will be much appreciated. And just as a little side, this is about engagement. 
and this is Europe engages in some ways, governments engaging. But if you'd like to take on, this is our last question. Um, uh, Esther, briefly. Okay, if I understood well, uh, I meant about engagement of society with uh, uh, people. Uh, 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 people. This is about people. people. Okay, okay, okay. So that that takes us to the to the fact that either we we have or we don't have a European demos. I mean, if people really feel engaged and involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that's of course. I mean, this is one of the questions that has been, you know talked and talk about it, the fact that it's true that people don't feel, you know, this sense of, uh, um, what do you say in English, you know, that you appartain to the brain, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. the, this idea that you are a member of this community. And I think that the really, this is one of the reasons why um, during the crisis on, you know, migration crisis, the Euro crisis, the feeling was immediately, you know, this community is not helping us. I mean, it's against us. Only the state and the nation is going to help our problems. And this is the kind of narrative, the kind of discourse the populist party you know, took themselves. You know, the idea that we have the sovereignty, we're going to help you, we're going to defend you against who? Against this kind of technocrats living in Brussels. They, they don't think on us. They only have, you know, this kind. And I think it's, it's, it's part of the, or I would say that's the basis, basic problem that the union is having these last years in terms of, producing policies and, 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 and being, and being uh, yeah. feeling legitimate, you know, mm -hmm. legitimate among, among population. Thanks, Esther, for this. Melton, we've seen, um, it's very interesting, the German Constitutional Court had to change the government's uh, um, um, plans for climate change because of the, because of the, the Fridays, the future Fridays, because of because of the younger generation. I mean, this is grassroots. This is the next generation. This feeds into your points about democracy, climate change, pandemic, security and everything. Um, but isn't there, and we have this convention of Europe, the, the People's Europe that's going to start on Sunday again, the convention. But isn't, isn't this some of the, the, isn't this the crux of the problem? The European demos, the lack of participation on, on inclusive, inclusive being more inclusive not just on the elitist level or the bureaucracy level or the enterprise level but a question of involving and explaining and communicating now that's a that's a perfect question i think one of the key issues is actually to create a you know public sphere that includes all different stakeholders that make up of the you know European uh, well demos the European societies now, which are no longer you know as homogeneous or you know as as as, as they were, but the instruments that the European Union and the member states have at their disposal to create such an inclusiveness or to create this public space are not sufficient, which then leads into two layers of uh, complications. One, I think, is directly related to the EU as a credible actor to respond to individual concerns. And the other one is directly related to the EU as a legitimate actor to basically make life better for all those who are involved. And that's you know an internal and external security challenge together. So in that way, it's actually how you know, foreign policy concerns are directly impacted from domestic uh, factors at home. And, you know, it feeds into everything we discussed so far, putting back the human at the very center of actually all security concerns. And there was another question in the chat on Turkey as well about the role that Turkey plays. I think that's for another another session. Okay. Chad, Chad, you have, th th thank you. Thank you, Esther. Chad, you've got the second last word. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, um, <laughs> you know, th th this whole question about the lack of people participation and the national flag deterring uh, uh, diverting public attention. I can. Hey, I, I told myself I was not going to talk about Brexit uh, today, and so I think Judy, uh, um, I should probably just just turn it back okay. over to you uh, okay. because uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean this 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 could um, this is a this is a great conversation. I mean, and uh, we are nothing without people, and we're nothing without ideas and conversations and engagement, 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 people to people. Um, 
I think it's just fundamental. It breaks down barriers. And it's what Rosa was saying earlier on. It's about it's about understanding each other's narrative. I'm afraid we have to wrap this up. You all must be starving. Um, I want to thank you all for a wonderful panel. Uh, Esther, Esther Barber, thank you, Esther. It was great to have you from Barcelona. And thank you, Chad from Edinburgh. Thank you, Melton from Istanbul. Uh, Martin, uh, he's over there in Blobsack. And I'm sorry we didn't have Tobias Schumacher. And for the great team in the background, we can't, we can't deal without these uh, behind the scenes teams. Thank you all very, very much. And the best of luck with the EU engages and I look forward to meeting you all again. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And thank you to, oh, thank you to participants as well. Wonderful audience. Great questions. Thank and a you. great moderator as well. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye. Bye.